How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody looking all bright eyed, bushy tail. How you doing, Randy? <laughs> hey, if this is your first time at Calvary Chapel, um, we say welcome. We're glad to have you, and uh, we're just so thankful that the Lord has uh, sent you our way. So uh, just be encouraged. Uh, in the meantime, let us pray. Lord, we love you, Lord. And Lord, we are so grateful for who you are. Lord, we know that we are in some trying times, and, uh, but we just pray and, and, and look to you, God, um, for our hope. We know that you are our hope, and we are just so thankful. Lord, as we get into today's service, Lord, Lord, I just pray, Father, that, um, that we will put aside um, um, whatever issues or, or things of the world that's going on and just focus on you. And as Pastor David give us the word today, God, Lord, I just pray, Father, that we will uh, be encouraged by it and we will apply it to our lives and, and uh, look to encourage others. Even as we go into worship on this morning, God, I just pray, Father, that we would just so focus on you and as Christian leaders, God, that we would just uh, focus on you and get that joy uh, that we know that you have for us, God. Lord, we love you, and we praise you. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, we do pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and stand as we start worshiping together this morning. Blessing the name of our Lord. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Take away, you give and take away, 
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're glad you're here. And for those of you joining us online, welcome also. If you do not receive our weekly email and you would like to, you can do so by emailing the church by going to david at ccermo.com. If you're in need of special prayer for any reason, there are prayer request forms in the back by the table. You can place those in the box, or you can also submit your prayer request online by going to ccrmo.com forward slash prayer, and we will lift you up before the Lord. We have our midweek Bible study here, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We have individual studies for men, for women, and also for our students. Uh, we're currently in the book of Daniel. We're just starting with that, and we'd love for you to join us. Our Bryan Center seniors are missing us, as you know, since we're unable to visit. But we can still send them our love through Bibles, crossword, puzzle books, snacks, drinks, and socks. They really love the socks. So please drop off any donations you may have here at the church. We don't pass the offering plate here at Calvary Chapel. You can give before or after the service at the back table. Or you can also give online at ccermo.com. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Let's go ahead and stand as we worship again.
here at Calvary Chapel on the first Sunday of each month. We partake of the Lord's Supper. Why do we do it? Jesus said in Luke twenty two nineteen, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Did he change mics? Okay. How about that? Much better? Good deal. Good deal. Once a month here at Calvary Chapel, we partake of the Lord's Supper. Why do we do it? Jesus said in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19, he said, do this in remembrance of me. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember that great thing that he did for us at Calvary. We remember the sacrifice that he made for your sin, for my sin in paying the price to, to satisfy the wrath of God and to enable God to forgive us of all of our sins. 700 years before Christ was crucified, the prophet Isaiah said, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourgings, we are healed. And then I like to call this verse the great exchange verse. And that's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Basically what that verse is saying is when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all your filthy garments, all your sin, all the guilt, all the things that you've done wrong, he takes those and he places them on Christ. And then, you ready for this? He takes the perfect Lamb of God. They t he takes, the Father takes Christ's righteousness and he places it on you. He places it on you. And you are forgiven, my friend. You have a new life because of the sacrifice that Jesus made at Calvary. You are forgiven. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the price has been paid. But when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the scripture also gives us, the, the church, careful instructions. It says we are to examine ourselves. We are to examine ourselves and have an honest conversation with ourselves between us and the Lord and say, Lord, is there anything that's come between you and me? Is, is there any sin? Is there any rebellious ways? And so we're going to pray. And if the Spirit brings something to your heart and mind, what do you do with it? Take it to his throne of grace. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And bring us into that intimate fellowship with the Lord. It's awesome. So, um, I came out this week, sanitized my hands real good opened up the box, and I put communion cups on each seat. So if you would, take your cup. And the way this works, if you haven't done it before, there's a clear layer on the top. You just want to peel it back, and you'll have a little wafer there on top. You're actually going to do two peelings. You're going to peel that first one back, and then um, that's the, the, the bread. And then in just a second, we'll peel back the cup. But our instructions for the Lord's Supper comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, where the scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Before we partake of that, let's pray and examine our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you invite us into not only 
a living personal relationship with you, God, but intimacy with you. And intimacy comes through repentance. Intimacy comes when we run from the things of the world, when we flee from the things of the world, and we draw near to you. Lord, thank you for grace. And thank you for forgiveness. Church, let's partake of the bread, remembering his great sacrifice for us at Calvary. First Corinthians chapter 11 continues. It says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peel back the second layer. For some of them, it's a purple top. Carefully, so you don't spill it. And let's partake of the juice, remembering what can wash away our sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's take. And then in communion, the third aspect of communion is we're told to look forward. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, which is the preceding verse on the Lord's Supper, it says, For as often as you drink this bread and drink this, drink this cup, um, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And he is coming again. Amen? Amen? Lord God, thank you. Thank you for communion. Father, thank you for the Lord's Supper. Father, let it do as your word says. Serve as a powerful reminder of what you did for us at Calvary. And now, Lord, as we sing these next two songs, let us draw near with sincere hearts full of faith, knowing that you desire intimacy with us. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Let's worship.
Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still remain. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain.
Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And Lord, we ask you to speak this morning. Speak that which is true, which is your word. As we study it, as we open our Bibles, as we look into it, as we study the word to show ourselves approved, to receive nourishment, to receive faith, to receive strength, Lord. Teach us this morning, Father. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this wonderful time of worship. And Father, as we get into your word, let your word get into us. In Jesus' name we pray, Father God. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. It's great to see everyone this morning. Well, as uh, the children are dismissed to Children's Church, we just started that back last Sunday. And um, just so you know that uh, we've been taking baby steps, taking one step at a time. This past Wednesday, we started our midweek Bible study. We're going through the book of Daniel, and um, all are welcomed. We have men's Bible study, ladies Bible study, student Bible study, and children's ministry. And then last Sunday, we re- restarted our kindergarten through uh, fifth grade class. And this Sunday... We've started our toddler baby room. So we're slowly getting back to normal, and, uh, and that's wonderful to see. It brings joy to my heart to see uh, the fellowship. And we're at probably at about 50, 60%, and um, hopefully the rest of our brothers, as, as we move further away from the COVID crisis, that more and more will come back and join us. But uh, in the meantime, they can join us online. Amen. Amen. So turn your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And this morning we will be looking at, we'll be studying verses 7, 7 through 20. 7 through 20. And what I want to do is I want to open up my message this morning. I want you to look directly at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Because that's the hub of my message this morning. That's the cornerstone. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. The scripture says, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold, excuse me, to take hold of the hope that is set before us. The theme of my teaching this morning is strong encouragement. Now, why do we need strong encouragement? We need strong encouragement because of the day and the times that we're living in. I'm not going to stand up here and make it sound like everything is good in our world because it's not. Things are going south with all the racism and prejudice and the violence and people dying in our streets. And everything that's taking place, it's, it's like a bunch of rotting apples. And we as the church, as the body of Christ, have got to rise up. we got to rise up. The only, the only issue with that, though, is, is you and I have emotions. You and I have, can see. You and I can hear what's going on. And what we see going on in the world can take us down. It can take us down, too, emotionally, as we see it taking place on TV. It, I probably, if I asked you to raise your hand, probably almost everyone would, would raise their hand saying how much it breaks their hearts. But church, what we got to do is we got to rise up. we got to rise up as Christians. And we've got to be light bearers. So my goal this morning, through teaching this to you guys and teaching this to our online audience, is to give you, as verse 18 says in chapter 6, strong encouragement. That's the theme this morning. I want to give you strong encouragement to rise up and go live for Christ Jesus and be a light in, be a, light in a dark world. So y'all want to do that? Y'all want to do that? I want, I want, I want, I want, I want you to... Uh, some, some Sundays you come to Calvary Chapel and your toes get stepped on. Some, 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 some Sunday mornings you're going to leave Calvary Chapel, but hopefully today you're going to leave Calvary Chapel with a joy in your heart, saying, you know what, I've received strong encouragement, and I'm going to go out and do what the preacher says. I'm going to go out and do what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen? So let's look at it. Calvary Chapel style, verse by verse through the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 7. The theme is strong encouragement. The scripture says, For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, receive a blessing from God. But it yields thorns and thistles. It is, 
excuse me, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends, its ends up being burned. Now we have an illustration here. He just got through talking to these Jewish believers. He walked them down off the cliff of abandoning faith in Christ. Remember, we looked at that last week in, in verses 4 through 6. And now he's given us an illustration. In this illustration in verse 7 and 8, the ground, or some of your translations say the earth, is all the people of the world. It's all the people of the world. The rain in verse 7 is the gospel. The gospel comes to all the people of the world through preaching, through proclamation. And there's only two responses. There's only two responses to the gospel. Either you accept it or you reject it. And there's two... Um, Things that produce in all people when they hear the gospel. The first one is found in verse 7. It says, it brings forth vegetation. Vegetation is good fruit. It's when a person hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and they rightly respond. How do you rightly respond? By opening your heart to Jesus. And saying, Lord, come into my life. I surrender my life to you. I repent of my sins. Come into my life. And when you do that, he comes in and he produces good vegetation. We need to have good vegetation. I'll talk a little, about, a little more about that in a minute. But basically, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about growing in holiness. He's talking about growing in the Word. But then he also says in verse 8, but it yields thorns and thistles. This, these are those who hear the gospel and they close their heart, and they reject it. And the fruit of the rest of their life is thorns and thistles, is walking in the flesh, is, is being carnal. So my question I pose to you this morning, verse, based on our verse-by-verse verse study of verses 7 and 8, is this. Does the fruit of your life match what you believe? Does the fruit of how you live everyday life, not talking about Sunday morning at Calvary Chapel Irmo, where we're all looking nice and pretty, but I'm talking about Monday through Saturday. Does the fruit of our life match what we believe? Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 24. It says, um, Paul's talking here about the, 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 the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just, I have fore, just as I have forewarned warned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is thorns and thistles. This is when a person hears the gospel, they don't respond, they harden the heart, I don't want to have nothing to do with this. And these are the thorns and the thistles of one who rejects Christ. They continue to live in the flesh. They continue to, be, to not be led by the Holy Spirit, but to be led by their carnal lust. Let that not be said of believers. But let's continue. Let's look at the, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7, where he talks about um, the, the brings forth vegetation. This is good vegetation starting at verse 22 up on your screen. He says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And look at verse 24. Look at verse 24 closely. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So part of coming to Christ is what we call repentance. And repentance is when you say, God, I'm sorry for breaking your law. I'm sorry for violating your commands. Please give me your spirit and help me to turn away from the sins and turn completely to you. And we crucify those old passions and those old desires. Why? Because they're thorns and thistles. You ever jumped into a, 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 a thorn patch? I, don't, I, I remember a little kid once I fell into one. It hurts. It brings destruction, it brings pain, it brings hurt. And that's what sin does. Sin destroys life. But Jesus gives life. Jesus gives life. And Jesus wants to produce uh, good vegetation in our life. That's how, the, one of the first ways I encourage you all this morning to respond is yield to the Spirit. 
is say, Lord, please take away, help me crucify, help me repent, and help me move away from the things of the flesh. And let me move wholeheartedly towards you. And my friend, you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own power. You need power from above. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to come in and and do that work of sanctification, to do that work of growth. That's how we move into this bringing forth solid vegetation. But again, we need to examine ourselves. and We need to ask ourselves, does the fruit of our life match our beliefs? That's one of the ways that we can impact this world around us. So I encourage you, I encourage you to, to take it to the Lord in prayer, that thing that you're struggling with, that thing that, that, that's nagging you in your flesh. Repent. Turn to the Lord. Ask him to help you to, to um, produce good fruit and to walk. If you want to um, go back and look at my teaching, I, 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 I spent a whole entire Sunday on these few verses of Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. Um, and we could go into each one, but, the, but my point is, looking at verses 7 and 8, is we see good vegetation versus thorns and thistles. And as Christians, let's be producing um, good vegetation. Amen? <clears throat> let's look at verse 9. Uh, chapter 6, verse 9 says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. I love this phrase here. I love this phrase in verse 9. It's a term of endearment. It's the, it's the heart of a shepherd. This, the, the author of Hebrews is speaking to the Jewish believers, and he's speaking from a heart of love. He's speaking from a heart of love to encourage them. You don't have to blast people to bring change. You, you don't have to blast people to bring correction. You can lovingly encourage them and let them see that heart of sincerity. In in verses 9, the author of Hebrews, remember last week we studied verses 4 and 6, he's walking the the recipients of this letter, he's walking them off the cliff of abandoning Christ and going back to Judaism. And he's saying, I got faith in you. I got faith in you. I got faith in God that he's going to lead you to greater and better things. And that not only are you not going to abandon Christ, but you're going to follow Christ, and now you're going to move on to maturity. God wants us to grow in maturity. And he wants us to walk in maturity. And he wants us to um, be completely surrendered to him. And in verse 9, he says, uh, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. And he says, things that accompany salvation. And somebody may be asking, Pastor David, what are things that accompany salvation? Number one thing that accompanies salvation is an unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ. An unwavering commitment to him in all situations. It's when he says one thing and the world says the opposite. Who's right? Christ Jesus. When the word of God says one thing and, 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 and the, the culture says another thing, who's right? Jesus, the, the, the word of God. It's an unwavering commitment to following him. Uh, things that accompany salvation is growing in holiness. You know, a person comes to Christ, what happens? They are justified instantly. Bam. Bam. You're made into a right relationship with God. Then you go from justification to sanctification. Sanctification is basically growing. It's growing and being set apart. You know, it's not, Christianity is not fire insurance. It's not coming to church, asking Jesus into your heart, receiving him as your Lord and Savior, and then going out living any way you want to. It's about coming in and making a commitment to him and continuing to serve him and growing in our holiness being set apart. Uh, Peter says, to be, ye, be ye holy, for I am holy. Acc- things that accompany salvation is doing what you're doing right now. You got your Bibles open. We're looking at it together. We're studying it. We're looking at the words. We're looking at the meaning. But it's growing deeper in the word. It's growing deeper in the word. Every single Bible verse, in, in, in the, every single verse in the Bible is uh, a sermon, is a teaching. You know, and we slow down and we, and we look at the meanings of all these phrases, but it's growing deeper in the word. Not so our heads can be all filled up with all this knowledge. That's not the point. I'm not here to make, make you a scholar, Rick. I'm not here to make you a scholar so you can go out and pontificate and say all the things that you want to say. I am here. We're getting into the word so you can grow 
on the inside so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, can do his work in Denise's heart. That's what we're doing. The Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. The, 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 the Bible is the Holy Spirit's word. But we go deeper. Let's look at one more. Prayer life. Things that accompany salvation is when we understand the importance of prayer. When we see things on the outside and we have no control over what our kids are doing or something that's taking place in the world, all this chaos that's around us right now, you know, there's nothing I can physically do to help them. But I know one I can go to. I know one thing I can do. I can pray. I can pray. And, and, and I know that my prayers are heard. And I know that God moves. And I can pray for the situation. So things that accompany salvation is when we grow in our prayer life. You know, we don't look at prayer as this dull, religious recital of words. But we look at prayers. I get to go to my prayer closet and have intimacy with my Father. And call upon his name. I, I, I so clearly remember that was one of my favorite parts of Christianity, if that's, what, if that's what you want to call it, when I was in the Navy. 1992, I came to Christ. If you've ever been in the Navy, we live in, we live in coffin racks. We live in coffin racks. Where I slept and I lived is the size of a coffin, literally. I'm laying there. I cannot come up. I will bump my head. But I would get into my coffin rack, I would shut my curtain, I would get my Bible out, flip that little light switch on, and that was my prayer time. That was my intimacy with my father. And, uh, you know, you weren't allowed to write, you know, that would be, you couldn't um, mark up government property. But the way my coffin rack was set up down at the bottom, they couldn't see on the underside. So if you look up on the underside of my coffin rack, I had all these Bible verses. But it was my place where I met with the Lord was that time of prayer and fellowship with him. These are the things that accompany salvation. And these are the things that I encourage you with this morning. Is grow in your prayer life. Grow in holiness. Grow in your unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ. We all have questions. We all have things we're wrestling with. What about this? What about that? Well, figure it out. Work it through. And say, I'm going to live for Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm going to live out these things that accompany salvation that the, this heart of this shepherd is speaking to these Jewish believers in verse 9. Let's look at verse 10. It says, For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. It just drips with endearment. It just drips with love. It just drips with compassion. Look at the words written 2,000 years ago. Having ministered and still ministering to the saints, I encourage you this morning, if you are serving in the church, outside of the church, in your community, I encourage you this morning to say this, God sees what you're doing. God, God sees your labor of love. God sees it. Okay? Whatever, whatever ministry you got going on to your children, whatever ministry you got going on in your neighborhood, in your community, Whoever you're ministering to, God sees it. And my friend, ministry done in the name of Christ Jesus is never in vain. Is never, ever in vain. I think about all the times in my life where my grandmother was praying for me. And I'd be in the living room, and as soon as she'd go in the kitchen, I'd cut it to MTV. So I could watch my heavy metal rock and roll. Bam, bam, bam. And as soon as I hear Grandma coming down the hallway, click, 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 Wheel of Fortune or, or whatever. I get it back to Wheel of Fortune. And my grandma used to share the gospel with me and preach to me. And I didn't respond for many years. But she was sowing seeds. She was sowing seeds. The things that she was saying to me, she was preaching to me, was getting into my heart, whether I realized it or not. I think about 1992, just got back from my first deployment, going down to Virginia Beach, down to the, the bars and the clubs, heading to the wrong place, and I'm, go, I'm walking down Ocean Boulevard in Virginia Beach. And this young man with his knees knocking and scared, he hands me a gospel track. And he, he, he was young, and I was like, oh, thanks a lot. I stuck it in my back pocket, and I kept on about my night. Never saw him again, never knew him again. What if that young man found out, that dude's a pastor today? 
Ministry is never in vain, my friend. Ministry is never in vain. Ministry starts um, in two areas. Ministry starts first with loving the body of Christ. Loving the body of Christ. Ministry starts within the body. You know, how we can help each other is spur each other on to good works and to strong faith. And then ministry also starts, uh, let's don't forget them, ministry starts with loving the world, with loving the people of the world. Jesus said, I came for sinners. I came for sinners. Jesus loves them people out there. And it's our job to do ministry to them, to love them in the name of Christ, to share the gospel with them. And to do our very best to bring them into the family of God. And I, I don't care what they look like. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't care how many piercings, how many tattoos. I don't care. Because Jesus loves them. Christ loves them. I don't, I don't, I don't care what their composition or who they are, whatever. It doesn't matter. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. So ministry starts in the body. It starts in the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this concerning ministry. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in, excuse me, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. What's he saying there in that verse? He's saying, my friend, dive in. Dive into ministry because it's not in vain. It's not in vain. In the church, outside of the church, in your community, in your family, uh, it's dive in and it's never in vain. Let's look at verse 11. In verse 11, remember guys, I'm I'm, I'm pumping you up. I'm just giving you encouragement. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pushing encouragement out to you to go out and live for Christ. Okay? Look at verse 11. It says, And we desire that each one of you Show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. The principle in verse 11 when it comes to encouraging you is this. Don't follow Jesus half-heartedly. Don't follow Christ half-heartedly. In verse 11, the NASB says, show the same diligence. I didn't look up what the other translations say, but in verse 11, it uses that word diligence. The Greek word is spude. The word spude means to go after with haste. It means to go after haste. It means there needs to be a sense of urgency in our Christian walk. There needs to be a sense of fire. There needs to be a sense of passion as we love Christ and we serve the community, we serve the church, and we serve the world. There needs to be a passion in your life, in my life. There needs to be a fire, a zeal that burns within us to honor him. Lord, light the flames. Light the passion. Set the people on fire in their hearts for Christ Jesus. Let us have a passion to honor him, to please him. And not to show it off, but let that world see it. Let that world see it in us. He's crazy. All all he wants to talk about is Jesus. All he wants to talk about is Christ. All he wants to talk about is the gospel. My friend, that's a compliment. Or ma'am, all she wants to talk about is Jesus. All she wants to talk about is is, is God. You know, there's that phrase, some people will say, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I disagree. I disagree. There's nothing wrong with being heavenly minded. Matter of fact, I would say the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you are. That's, that's, That's my conviction. That's my belief. But, it's, but, but anyway, it says, verse 11, we are desire each one of you show the same diligence. I want to encourage you this morning to show the same diligence. Don't be half-hearted, but uh, the Greek word spude, to go after with haste. Let there be a sense of urgency. Let that word of encouragement come to your, your heart this morning. Verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and impatience inherit the promise. So what's he saying there in verse 12? He says, in your Christian walk, don't be sluggish. To be sluggish means um, there's no enthusiasm. There's no vitality. There's no growing. And it's one of the not so good places to be. Because you know what it is? You turn religious. You turn religious. And you have no life, no vitality. 
God wants us to have passion, and he doesn't want us to be sluggish. He doesn't want us to be um, slow to grow, but he wants us to be eager and excited to get into the word and to spend time with fellowship, for them ladies to rub shoulders together and to encourage each other and to pray for each other on Wednesday nights, for us men to do the same on Wednesday nights, for you guys to meet together at Starbucks on an off night. I love meeting for coffee. I love grabbing some of you guys and saying, hey, let's have a cup of coffee. Because it encourages us to not be sluggish in our growth. And a lot of times when I, when I meet with men, and this goes for my past 20 years, is this. I find out we're going through some of the same struggles. We're going through some of the same difficulties. And I find another brother that can encourage me, that can encourage me, and that I can encourage And that's very important in the body of Christ that we give strong encouragement. You know, there's nothing more, there's nothing greater than when a brother is wrestling with a sin, he's struggling with his flesh, and he comes to me or he comes to you and says, man, I need help. What should you and I do? You listen here, you better, you know, give give them the Bible bash. No, we encourage them with the word of God. We put our arm around them. And we help them. We hold them accountable. And we encourage them to move forward in their walk with Christ. Um, so, verse 12, find, here's, here's, a, here's a little nugget for you. Verse 12, find someone who's on fire for the Lord and connect with them. Okay? Find someone who has a passion and a zeal for Christ and connect with them. And a lot of times, you know, that, that passion will catch on. As, as, as that other person encourages you. And you'll, you'll see that passion in them. You'll see that fire in them. And you'll be like, hey, wait a minute. I want some of that. And it passes that way. That's the way it works. Let's look at verses 13. 13, we're going to dive a little deeper. I, I want you to see this. I, I spent a lot of time studying it this week. And um, what I'm fixing to present to you now This is the absolute strongest encouragement I can give you. This encouragement that I'm fixing to give you now leads to a steadfast faith. And I want to give it to you up front so you can be thinking about my principle as we're studying the text. And that is this. Here's the encouragement for you this morning. And you've heard it throughout most of your life. But I want it to become real as you, as you got your Bibles open and you're looking at the scriptures, I want it to become real to you. And that principle is this. You can trust the promises of God. You can trust the promises of God. The day and age we're living in, everybody's asking, who can I trust? Who's telling the truth? You know, just go ahead and just shut down the social media, shut down the news networks, <coughs> shut all those voices out. Because there's only one source of, of truth and that is the word of God and you can trust all the promises of God they're completely trustworthy I'm encouraging you now let your faith arise in the promises of the Bible every single one it's all inspired by God and our illustration that the author of Hebrews is going into is Abraham so what I did um, if you would, bring up verse 13. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, roughly, uh, the author of Hebrews is making a reference to Genesis 22. So in Calvary Chapel style, verse by verse, understanding what the text is saying, on the left-hand side is our verse-by-verse study. On the right-hand side is the text that the author of Hebrews is referring to. So I just want you to see that as we go through it. So you understand. But the point is this. God is getting the message across to Abraham that you can trust my promises. Y'all ready? Let's take a look at it. Hebrews, you can look at the screen. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore to himself. The author is referring to Genesis 22, verses 15 through 16, where it says, the Old Testament says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not have withheld your son, your 
only son. Now, if you know anything about scriptures, the Old Testament, what's taking place in Genesis chapter 22? God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah and make her sacrifice. He goes up there. He tells the, the servants, hey, you stay right here. Me and my son will be back. And he goes up to Mount Moriah. And as he's about to sacrifice his son, God stops it, provides a lamb that's in the thicket. And he tests Abraham. Genesis 22 says, he, he tests Abraham, and then after he tests Abraham, and he sees Abraham's commitment to him, remember, Abraham's like you and I. He has frailties. He struggles with faith, I'm sure. He struggles with faith. He struggles with obedience. He struggles with not always doing what's right. God makes a promise. God makes a promise to Abraham after he... Uh, provides a lamb in the place to, to make the sacrifice and his son is not sacrificed. Uh, back in these ancient days, um, it was customary in the Old Testament to swear by a higher name. But for God to swear, which is what he does in, 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 in um, Genesis 22, there is no higher name. There is no higher name. So, um, so, so why why does God swear? He says um, there in verse 16 up on the screen, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Why, why does God swear to Abraham? It gives, what it, the reason he swears to Abraham is because it gives Abraham the faith and assurance to believe. You know, sometimes, let's be honest, our hearts are slow to believe. Our hearts are slow to accept the promise our hearts are slow to embrace what God says. So in Genesis 22, I believe, it's my conviction, that, that God is giving Abraham the faith and assurance to believe when he says there in verse 13, and he swore to himself. Let's look at the next, next passage, next verses of 14 through 15. Continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study with the parallel reference to the Old Testament. He says, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise, is what Hebrews says. Now, you can read it, but over there in uh, Genesis 22, verse 17 on the screen, it says, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voices. So the obvious question for the thinking Christian who's looking at the, the text in Hebrews and looking at the text in Genesis chapter 22, the obvious, the legitimate question is this. Does God keep his promise to Abraham? And it all can be answered in looking at the text on the right in Genesis 22, 17 through 18, when you answer the question, who are these seeds? Who are these seeds that are referenced in Genesis 22, 17 to 18? There's actually two seeds. Um, in verse 17, I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand of the seashores. This seed is clearly a reference to Abraham's descendants. And roughly in 2020 today, there are roughly 14 million physical descendants of Abraham, our Jewish friends. There's roughly 14 million. And then there's millions of more spiritual descendants of Abraham. And guess who that is? There you go. So does God keep his promise to Abraham? Yes. There's the physical descendants. There's the nation. There's the whole Abrahamic covenant, which I believe is in Genesis 12, that talks about the land promise, the people promise, the kingdom promise. But here specifically in Genesis 22, with God keeping his promise to Abraham, I hope you're following me because this is so good. And this, this should bring encouragement to your hearts is that God was faithful to his promises he made to Abraham. Now, I also want to point out to you 
in verse 18. Look at verse 18 closely. He says this, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So we have two references in this passage in Genesis chapter 22, reference to two seeds. And so what's the question for verse 18? Who is the seed? So I present to you this. Well, I don't want to present it to you because I'm just kind of setting you up for your thinking answer and me giving you the answer. But the question is, who is the seed in, in, in verse 18? Who is the seed in verse 18? I'm going to save you hours of scholarly research and diving into the, to the text and all the commentaries. And I'm going to go to the best commentary on the Bible, and that is the Bible itself. Listen to what Galatians 3.16 says. This is thousands of years later. Paul's writing the book of Galatians. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and two seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed. Who is the seed? Christ Jesus. Was God faithful to Abraham? Yes. yes. He was faithful to Abraham in all respects. And the point of the passage um, th that um, the, I believe the author of Hebrews is bringing out in the text is he's telling Abraham, you can trust in my promises. And what does that say to us today? I encourage you this morning. I, I, I heap loads of encouragement on you now to say, you can trust in the promises of God. He will be faithful always. He will be faithful, and you can trust on every word that he says and, and every promise that he has. You can rest your life on it. You can lay your head on your pillow at night and sleep in peace because you trust in the promises of the Lord. He is faithful. Be encouraged, church. Be encouraged, Christian, that you can trust the promises of the Lord. Let's look at verse 16. He says, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. So basically, God has made an oath. God has swore by his very name. You know what God's doing when he does that? He's, God is placing his very existence God is placing his very existence, his integrity, and who he is behind his word. What does that say about the Bible? That should elevate our view of Scripture big time. To know that we can trust in his promises. That we can trust in his word. He's making an oath. He's, he swore by his name. He, he's standing behind what is written in Scripture. And that's what will keep us from being sucked into the ways of the world and living as lights in a dark world. Verse 18, he says, um, continuing, the, the author of Hebrews is driving home this point, and I'm going to drive it right behind him as I'm teaching the word, but he's driving home the same point. And here it is, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. Verse 18, another message right here. There's no lies in God. There, there's, no, there's no lies. There's no falsehood in God. His promises and his truth are immutable. Immutable it means they can't be changed. Nothing can change them. They are steadfast. They are firm. They are so steadfast and so firm. This is what the, the, the Bible says, what God's word says about itself. Because he validates himself. He validates his word. Psalms 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. It's firmly fixed in the heavens. It's stronger than the heavens. It will outlast the heavens. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, the universe will crumble 
and we'll go into heat death and, and, and things will, will just fall away and be destroyed before one promise fails. His word is that sure. It will outlast everything. I encourage you this morning, you can trust the promises of God. They are a sure foundation as you go out into the world, as you live your life, trust in his promises. To, to reject God's promises is the most foolish thing an individual can do. But to trust and believe them, you are showing wisdom, my friend. You are showing wisdom. Let's finish it up, verses 19 through 20. Uh, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and the one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I'm not really going to go into verse 20 because we're fixing to spend the whole entire next chapter on this subject. But let's look at verse 19. You know, it says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters into the veil. It, you know, it seems like today, today's world, to me at least, it seems like everybody believes in Jesus. Everybody believes in Jesus. But here's the big question. Is he the anchor of your soul? Is, is, is he the anchor of your soul? What's the purpose of an anchor? The purpose of an anchor is to hold you steady. I love striper fishing on Lake Murray, if you haven't seen my pictures on Facebook. And I just got me a new trolling motor, and we're getting out there on the lake, and I got my depth finder going, I got the trolling motor going, and as soon as I see them fish on the screen, drop anchor. Drop anchor. We're, drop, we're fishing right here. We're fishing right here because I don't want to be moved. And I want to catch all of them fish. That's the purpose of that anchor, is to hold me steady so I can fill up with my limit of striper and take them home and have a fish fry that night. That's the purpose of an anchor on Lake Murray. The purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ being our anchor is so that we are not moved. We are not shaken. We're, we're not dismayed. But we have this firm anchor. The purpose of an anchor is to hold you, to ground you, to keep you from moving. Let's, let's test your anchor. Let's, test, let's, look at, let's ha, ha, let you have a little self-evaluation of your anchor. When the, world and the, when the world says something that contradicts the word of God, do you drift away? Do you drift away? Do you, do you move away from the truth? When the world says it's okay to abort an unborn baby, and they're, and they're trying to shove this down our throats, that this is okay, and the word of God says, no, I formed you in the womb, and life is precious, and life begins at conception. You know, we drift away when we move away from that position of what the Scripture says concerning the preciousness of the, of the unborn life. Our anchor has to hold firm on our personal relationship with Christ and everything that the Bible says concerning this subject. People are looking for people with convictions, with believers with convictions. And part of our convictions is that we hold to everything the Scripture says you know, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to the sanctity of life, or, uh, just when it comes to how we treat each other, you know, prejudice and racism has no place in the church. It has no place in the life of the believer. You know, we love all people, red, white, yellow, black, blue, whatever color they are. We, we love all people. We care for all people. And we don't let the culture bait us in to um, compromising our convictions um, on any of those subjects. We have to stand, we have to stand firm. And if we have, if we have um, crossed the line in any of those areas I've talked about, we serve a God who forgives. We serve a God who forgives and restores us and we, we pulled up anchor, we, we've drifted away. Some people call that backsliding, people call it drifting away. God says, you know what, come back to me, reset your anchor. Reset your anchor and stand for what is true. That's what it means to let this anchor firmly hold us. Our generation is asking the big questions today. Um, just look at social media, look at the news, look at the conversations, and the, the, the questions they're asking is this, who can I trust? Who can I trust? You know, I think trust is at an all-time low today. 
especially with our youth and the, and the younger generation. And it's because they're seeing all the stuff they're seeing in, in the media and all this hypocrisy. And, the, and, and I didn't mention all ago, but the politics. You know, politicians are corrupt. You know, it's, it's not, it's in all areas. But who can I trust is the question that they're asking. Who is telling the truth? Church, let's be the ones. Let's show them that Christ Jesus can be trusted and that they can trust in the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. I hope and my prayer is that you leave here this morning with strong encouragement. That's the mission. And if you leave here with strong encouragement, I feel like I've accomplished my mission as a preacher. I want to encourage you with strong encouragement this morning. Again, just in closing summary, is uh, to go out and be a fruitful believer. Go out and be a fruitful believer. Touch people with the gospel and, and live by the fruits of the Spirit and grow in holiness and grow in maturity. You know, don't be sluggish. Don't, don't be sluggish. Be slow to what you hear in the media. Be slow to hear and believe what you see on social media. But man, be quick to believe and trust what you see in the Bible. He was faithful to Abraham. He'll be faithful to you. Make Jesus the anchor of your soul. Don't be moved. Get, 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 get your relationship right with the Lord. Get into his word. Get on that firm foundation. And then drop down that anchor and say, Lord, I'm holding firm. I'm holding firm. That's, that's my encouragement. And finally, uh, I love the author's reference to Abraham. And I encourage you this morning to trust in the promises of God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this strong encouragement from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 through 20. Lord, let us leave here encouraged. Let us take our eyes off our own circumstances and what's going on in this world and let us fix our eyes on you. And Lord, let us be a source of encouragement for those around us, for those who are downtrodden and their hearts are hard and their minds are down because of everything that's going on. Let us lift them up with the gospel. Let us point people to you. And Lord, help us to live in this truth. Father, thank you for your unchanging word. Thank you for this study. And I pray, Father God, for each and every one of us that we leave here this morning, as the text says, with strong encouragement. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Amen. I'm gonna we're going to close with a song. And um, Andy mentioned a while ago, you can fill out a prayer request. You can submit it online. But also, if you're here this morning and you need special prayer, don't, don't hesitate to grab me. Grab me or my wife or one of the leaders and, and ask for a special prayer. We want to minister to you in all ways and every way we can. Amen. And thank you for the visitors that are visiting with us this morning. If you have any questions, please grab me after service so I can tell you more about um, Calvary Chapel Irma. God bless you guys. Nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way And bring me back to you
so thankful for all that you've done in our lives and may we draw close to you and will you draw close to us Lord so as we go out this week I just pray that we will continue to be in your word continue to pray to communicate with you Lord because you are there with us and so we just praise you and thank you for that Lord as we go out this week I just pray that we continually praise your name and be a light to those around us it's in the name of Jesus I pray Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.